Despite a whopping 1.2 trillion euro budget over seven years, you might scratch your head wondering why the EU moves at a snail's pace when tackling big problems like recessions, pandemics, or even wars like the one in Ukraine. It poses an interesting contrast. How can a powerhouse like the US conjure a plan in mere weeks, while the EU seems ensnared in a seemingly perpetual loop of negotiations? Like the US, the EU has a budget to cope with policies and crises, but it has two major flaws. First, it is actually quite small. The EU budget accounts for only 1.1% of European GDP, or 173 billion euros annually which pales in comparison to the US, where federal spending constitutes at least 24% of GDP. Second, it lacks autonomy, as it relies on member states for approximately 75% of its funding, rather than being funded by citizens' taxes. The size of the budget and its financing resources are also determined by unanimous agreements among the 27 member states, hampering the EU's speed and efficiency. A potential solution is the establishment of a fiscal union. This would empower the EU to finance itself autonomously by generating its own resources, rather than primarily relying on contributions from member states. The EU would also need to make changes to the budget procedure by involving the European Parliament and making it more democratic. In this video, we delve into the history of EU financing, the challenges we face today, and potential solutions to enhance the EU's fiscal autonomy. And stay with us until the very end, where we will also share our opinion whether the EU should develop into an ever closer fiscal union. Also, this video was made with the contribution of Giulia Rossolillo, Professor of European Union Law at the University of Pavia, member of the Executive Bureau of the Union of European Federalists and director of the political review, The Federalist. To understand how we got to today, let's have a brief look at the Union's 70-year history. In the 1950s, the European coal and steel community, the first version of what later became the European Union, emerged as a pioneer in the world of international organizations financed by its own resources. Own resources refers to revenues that are decided upon and collected directly by the EU to fund its budget. The ECSC did so by implementing two main strategies, imposing levies on the production of coal and steel and borrowing money. The levies were collected directly by the ECSC from coal and steel producing companies, which ensured that the ECSC's treasury was centralized and independent of national treasuries. The ECSC had the power to set the levy rate without unanimous agreement from all the member states. However, things changed in 1957 with the creation of the European Economic Community and the European Atomic Community. These organizations relied on member state contributions as their primary source of financing. However, the member states agreed that in the future it should be possible to switch to an own resource system, but this would require a unanimous council decision, consultation of the European Parliament, and ratification of this decision by the member states. This switch happened in 1970, when a true system of own resources was implemented for the financing of the European Economic Community. This system was based on three sources, custom duties, agricultural levies, and a percentage of the revenue from value-added tax. This meant that member states no longer had to make direct contributions to the budget. Then, in 1988, as the European community's roles expanded and revenues from custom duties and agricultural levies dropped, a fourth resource was introduced, a percentage of each member state's gross national income. As part of my research, I love watching documentaries that delve into the history and intricate workings of the EU. However, these vital visual resources are often only found on platforms like iPlayer. Which is why I use Atlas VPN, today's sponsor, to watch documentaries that are only available in the US or the UK. Atlas VPN unlocks your favorite content from all over the world, so check them out and sign up today. Moreover, with Atlas VPN, you can bid farewell to intrusive ads and harmful malware, ensuring uninterrupted and secure viewing. It also prioritizes your privacy by safeguarding your online searches, shielding your personal information from prying eyes. 
Additionally, Atlas VPN offers unlimited device protection, ensuring a seamless and secure experience across all your devices. Therefore, grab the Atlas VPN summer deal now because Atlas VPN Premium is just $1.83 per month, plus three months extra. And with a 30-day money-back guarantee, there's no risk of trying it out yourself. Back to the video. Over time, the fourth resource became the largest contributor to the EU budget. Today, the EU budget from 2021 to 2027 looks like this. 1.2 trillion euros from the multi-annual financial framework, of which 75% is made up of national contributions, and 25% is made up of own resources. Another 800 billion euros comes from the next generation EU recovery package, essentially an EU loan, which was introduced during COVID-19. It is ironic that in terms of financial autonomy, the EU's first version in 1951, the European Coal and Steel Community, had the purest form of an EU-owned resource, with its direct tax collection from steel and coal companies. Ever since, the EU has become less independent, now relying more on member states for its budget than ever before. But is this a problem? We have identified three key challenges with the current budget. First, the lack of EU autonomy. When an organization relies on financial contributions from states, its ability to act is ultimately determined by the willingness of the states to provide those funds. In times of economic crisis or changing priorities, states may reduce their contributions, which can endanger the organization's existence. Moreover, national contributions to the EU budget can weaken the sense of solidarity within the EU. Countries that contribute more may start questioning the value they receive in return. During the Brexit campaign, for example, a red bus symbolized this sentiment, promising redirected funds to the National Health Service instead of paying for the EU. Second, the European Parliament has a very limited role in setting up EU revenues, currently only serving in a consultative capacity. In the EU's early years, the Parliament's lack of power made sense, as members were appointed, not elected. But as the Parliament is elected by EU citizens today, it's unjustified to limit its say in deciding EU resources. Essentially, citizens' representatives should have equal footing with the Council. Third, member states have the exclusive power to determine the EU revenues and the size of the EU budget. Unanimous agreement from member states is required to create or modify the own resources that finances the budget. This obviously leads to resistance when the EU budget needs to be increased, particularly during times of crisis. The EU budget is notably smaller than national budgets too. For instance, it is approximately equivalent to Denmark's national budget, a country with a population of 5.6 million, and approximately 30% smaller than Poland's budget, serving 38 million people. Yet it will be difficult to increase this when it requires unanimity from the member states. So what can the EU do? The challenges mentioned are interconnected and cannot be addressed in isolation. Thus, we propose a three-tiered strategy, each level with different degrees of impact. First, raising more own resources and moving away from member state contributions. This can be done by implementing new sources of revenue, such as, but not limited to, a financial transaction tax, a web tax, or a carbon tax. For example, with the financial transaction tax, the EU could levy a 0.1% tax rate against all trades made in the EU, thereby generating new resources that could replace some of the national contributions. The procedure of implementing this is already defined and requires unanimity of the Council of the EU. However, one key problem remains. The decision on the amount and type of resource would still require a compromise between all 27 national governments, who may have different interests and therefore block the deal. This brings us to our second tier, empowering the EU Parliament. The European Parliament should take a more significant role in the EU budget process in two ways. Firstly, the Parliament's decision-making powers should be enhanced to give it equal status with the Council in determining EU revenues. This means removing the Council's unanimity requirement and giving the European Parliament a co-decision power. Secondly, the European Parliament should have an active role 
in negotiating the EU's long-term budget and the authority to propose its own budget or make substantial alterations to the Commission's proposal. This would give the Parliament more influence in shaping the EU budget process. However, implementing these changes would require amendments to the EU treaties, a process necessitating agreement from all member states. Therefore, this is definitely more difficult to achieve. This brings us to our third tier, becoming a true fiscal union. A fiscal union would fundamentally reshape the EU financial landscape, as member states would no longer make direct contributions and the EU would decide the amount and type of its fiscal resource independently of the unanimous consent of the member states. This could be in the form of EU-wide taxes, such as the aforementioned financial transaction tax, or even a small income tax levied across all EU citizens. For example, take the US model, where a federal tax could be applied to all citizens potentially a minimal rate, such as 1%, while member states would of course continue to levy their own taxes. This could lead to three clear advantages. On the one hand, it would free up resources at state level, because the member states would no longer have to contribute to the EU budget. On the other hand, some argue it would not lead to an increased tax burden on citizens because the possibility for the EU to meet transnational challenges with its own resources would avoid duplication of expenditure at national level. For example, let's take a European army. Currently, member states maintain 27 separate national armies, which can be costly and inefficient. However, by establishing an EU army, a fiscal union would consolidate defense efforts, reduce duplication and promote cost effectiveness. This could result in substantial savings for member states, allowing them to allocate resources to other pressing needs, such as healthcare, education, and infrastructure. Thirdly, the elimination of national ratifications and of the unanimity in the Council would allow it to react promptly to emergencies or unexpected events through an adjustment of the budget's resources. In my personal opinion, a comprehensive fiscal union may not be realized in the near future. However, I believe that increasing the EU's own resources and granting more power to the European Parliament would be a sensible and beneficial step forward. By moving away from member state contributions and enabling the Parliament to play a more significant role in budget decisions, we can enhance accountability, efficiency and democratic representation within the Union. But what do you think? Let us know in the comments. And thank you everyone for helping me hit 40,000 subscribers. I really appreciate all the amazing support. The next target is 50k. So if you haven't done so already, please subscribe and like the video if you enjoy the content. And if you want to support the channel further, please consider signing up to Patreon. Until next time.